and thank you for attending this debate. This is the Utah House District 49 debate. We have our candidates Robert Spendlove and Siamak Kajinori here today. Thank you for being here. My name is Hannah Anderson and I will be moderating this debate on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Utah. Um, thank you to our co-sponsors, both the League of Women Voters of Utah and the Better Utah Institute. The way the format of this debate will go is that each candidate will have five minutes to introduce themselves um, and then we will go into our question section. We have four questions that were composed by the League of Women, Women Voters and we will accept two questions from the audience. Some of these will be submitted beforehand and some will be submitted to the chat, which you can submit to throughout the debate, which will be monitored. After that, the uh, alternative candidate will have about 30 seconds for a rebuttal and will be given four opportunities to rebuttal throughout the debate. To conclude, we'll have five minutes of closing statements um, and then we will be done. So to, to begin, we'll have CMAC introduce himself and uh, start his opening arguments. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I want to also thank the League of Women Voters and Better Utah, my esteemed counterpart, Representative Robert Spenlove. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, indeed, it is an honor to be here. In 1978, I moved to Salt Lake City from Tehran, Iran, and by myself at the age of 16. A few months later, the government in Iran collapsed and the uh, revolutionary government took power. Iranian students in Salt Lake were stranded with no income and no work permit. After graduating from Highland High School, I attended Weber State College and later University of Utah where I received my bachelor's in political science. I lived on the Navajo reservation for two years and experienced what most people don't get to experience in a lifetime. In 1983, my life changed forever. I applied for and became a US citizen. I worked as a juvenile court probation officer as well as youth correctional officer. While I loved working with the Metro Gang Task Force, I could not ignore the, the underlying factors why young women and men ended up in the justice system. After a few years, I decided to change careers and do something that would profoundly impact the lives of these youth by working in the mental health field instead. In the late 90s, I started a 68-bed residential treatment center for adolescents in Southern Arizona and eventually expanded it to several programs throughout that state. At the same time, I partnered with others and built an 80-bed psychiatric hospital in Tucson, Arizona. Sonora Hospital is now a flagship psychiatric hospital in Arizona. Upon Returned to Utah, I became the CEO at Highland Ridge Hospital in Midvale. I married my wife and best friend, Lisa, who is an educator, and together we have lived in Sandy since 2005. I'm a proud father of four children, Sahar, Sayed, Setare, and Aryan. My mother has always been my role model as a strong, well-educated attorney, still practicing in Tehran. Some call me Farmer CMAC because I manage a two acre farm named Esther, Esther's Garden Salt Lake on two acres belonging to Congregation Kolami, a Jewish synagogue. We grow organic fruits and vegetables and donate them to several homeless shelters. I'm also on the board of directors of the Alliance House in downtown Salt Lake, which is a nonprofit organization serving the mentally ill with services including life skills, employment, and housing. Professionally, I'm the current partner and CEO of Altium Health, an addiction medicine and psychiatric clinic in West Jordan. Altium Health serves patients struggling with addictions and mental health challenges in person and by telehealth to clinics throughout the state of Utah. I'm a passionate advocate of access to mental health and addictions treatment and participate in region-wide discussions surrounding them. I serve on and participate in several professional organizations and associations, including Salt Lake County Mental Health and Substance Abuse Treatment Providers Combined Council. Thank you. Thank you, CMAC. Robert, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks so much. I first wanna thank CMAC for, uh, for running and for 
uh, being part of this important process. And <clears throat> I also want to thank uh, the Better Utah Institute and uh, League of Women Voters for hosting this. Um, so before I even kind of start off, I, I, I've always enjoyed watching debates. I've, I'm kind of a debate nerd. I was in a debate club in high school. Um, but what I saw yesterday was frankly shocking. Um, you know, I, I started off, this is how bad I am. I watched the governor's debate because I just love the debates and it was really good. And they were resp respectful, civil, focused on policy. And I went away from that debate feeling like I understood those candidates better. And then I turned over to the presidential debate and I couldn't be more embarrassed and ashamed. Uh, the, the candidates were more interested in scoring political points uh, than having substantive policy discussions. Uh, and I think it really uh, uh, w was a detriment to our entire country. And I'm, I, and I, and I'm ashamed that it went down that way. Um, so my commitment, th this is the, the, the third debate that I've had uh, since I've been in office, uh, a kind of a campaign debate. And I've always appreciated uh, the the way that uh, that the league or the, my first one was with the University of Utah, uh, my second one uh, was with uh, the Bitter Utah Institute, and uh, uh, both of those were m much like what we saw last night with the the governor's office debate. And my commitment uh, tonight is that I will have that that I will focus on the policy issues, focus on the issues that people care about, the issues that really matter. And so those issues to me are really focusing on policy over politics. Uh, my goal is to build bridges. I want to bring people together to solve some of these difficult problems that we're facing uh, and not trying to score political points. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I was born and raised in Utah. Um, interesting thing with, uh, with CMIC is uh, I went to East High. So there's a, there's a, Ooh, <laughs> <my wife. laughs> um, then, then I uh, graduated uh, with a degree in economics from Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction. I uh, came back to, uh, <clears throat> to Utah after that and uh, started um, work, immediately working in the governor's office. Uh, while I was there, I got my master's degree in public administration uh, with an emphasis in economic public policy. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of the ultimate policy nerd. Uh, I worked in the, the, the governor's office for most of my career, about 15 years, in a variety of roles. I started off as a research analyst, uh, then I became the state demographer, uh, the governor's chief economist, uh, then I was the, uh, the policy director, uh, the, uh, and uh, kind of ended off as the deputy chief of staff for uh, state and federal relations. Uh, ever since I uh, was elected, uh, I uh, left the governor's office and I've uh, been working and what I currently do is I'm the senior economist for Zions Bank. And so uh, I, I really kind of focus my time on kind of watching the economy. Um, and that's what I want to talk about just for a little, uh, just for a minute uh, in, in the rest of my opening. Um, you know, because I've been thinking about this and talking about this a lot, that the coronavirus has, uh, uh, has brought on a period of, uh, of unprecedented uncertainty in our country. Uh, 20 million people lost their jobs in America in April alone. The unemployment rate jumped nearly 15% in the spring, uh, the highest we've seen since the Great Depression. The gross domestic product contracted by more than 31% uh, in, uh, in the second quarter. We've, in our lifetimes, we've never seen these kind of economic conditions. Now we're doing much better. Our state is improving, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, Utah's unemployment rate is down to 4.1% uh, from 10% earlier this year. Our economic recovery is the second best in the country. However, there are still 48,000 fewer jobs in Utah today than there were a year ago. And right now, we have over 30, uh, or three times as many people uh, receiving unemployment insurance benefits than a year ago. Uh, we need to continue working together to bring our state, uh, uh, bring our state together and come through this difficult, pe uh, th this difficult period. Uh, if I'm reelected, re I will continue to focus on helping uh, the people of Utah and of our district improve our state uh, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I realize I, for I neglected to introduce our wonderful timekeeper, Janice Mosby, who's also at the league. She will be holding up time cards, letting us know when we are about out of time. 
All right, now we will move on to the questions uh, submitted by the League of Women Voters. The first question will go to you first, Robert. The question is, the League of Women Voters has actively supported the 2018 Proposition 4 for an independent redistricting commission. Do you support making any further changes to the proposition and how would you go about choosing a member of the newly formed redistricting commission? You yeah, I, oh, sorry. Oh, yes, I, I don't think we uh, need to make any further changes. We work very closely uh, with the promoters of the, of the creation of the uh, uh, redistricting commission to create a fair, uh, uh, a fair and I think equitable system uh, for picking those people that should be part of the commission, I think we need to make sure that uh, that uh, partisan politics are not part of that. Uh, you know, like I said, I used to be the state demographer. That's the kind of people that we need doing the, this, are demographers with understanding of population characteristics, people that understand how population is changing, where it's moving, and really with the goal of making sure that we have the kind of equity that we need. We, we, we do not need we should not have uh, partisan politics being part of uh, redistricting. It's just a matter of, of demographics and population movements. Thank you, Robert. Same, CMAC, same question to you, CMAC. Could you please tell us about your feelings about Proposition 4? Well, the, we, we all went to the polls and we all decided that we wanted to have an independent um, redistricting commission. And Unfortunately, we came back only about three months ago where the, uh, the legislature took it upon itself to basically gut it and introduce something that was totally different. I still uh, support the original proposition for an independent redistricting that is accountable only to the people of the state with uh, transparency um, to the constituents. So I absolutely, uh, support that, the original intent of Proposition 4. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the second question. CMAC, this is for you first. Utah was ranked the worst state for women's equality for the third year in a row. Do you plan to address this? And if so, how? Well, it's a, it's a terrible distinction to have. And we uh, continue um, ignoring that. Um, We've, uh, we've had several um, legislation on the national level that have tried to address this. Parity, um, equality in wages, and we in Utah continue to lag uh, behind most states in that. I believe that equal rights should be afforded, not only afforded, it should be the law of the land. Equal rights to all. Equal rights amendment is one way to get there. There should be no question that a job done by a man and a woman should be paid at the exact same rate. Um, to me, that is not a, um, that, that's a no-brainer. And I will do everything I can. I will work across the aisle to achieve that. Thank you very much. Robert, your response? Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, I think this is, this is one of the uh, really important issues that all of us are facing that we need to uh, continue to be working on. Um, I'm really proud that I've been uh, uh, working with and supporting issues like this throughout my time in the legislature, before my time in the legislature, uh, too. Uh, one of the areas specifically um, that I've been very concerned about is, uh, is violence towards women. Uh, uh, as well, I'm not sure how many people know, but the, the horrible uh, uh, murder of a young mother in our district just a few years ago. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was right around the end of school. My young daughter uh, was walking home from, uh, from elementary school and actually heard the shots. I mean, it, it, it shocked all of us. Um, and so uh, it, it was one of those issues where I said, I need to step up and I need to be personally working on this. And I have been working on that for the past several years, working with uh, the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition to put more restrictions on, uh, on those uh, people that have protective orders, to get the courts to uh, take this seriously, to increase the penalties for those that abuse uh, their, uh, their partners. And I will continue to work with them and try to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
As a reminder, please continue to submit questions to the chat box. Um, we will have some questions from the audience at the end. All right, our third question, Robert, we'll start with you. How, do you how would you proactively address civil unrest in the area of Black Lives Matter and defunding the police? Yeah, this is, uh, th this is something I've actually been thinking a lot about. Um, I think we, we're in such a tough period in our country right now. Um, th this isn't a new issue. This is an issue that we've been struggling with for decades, for hundreds of years, trying to achieve uh, greater uh, equality, greater inclusion among all members of our society. And I think we all need to really kind of step back and say, put ourselves in the shoes of other people, put ourselves in, uh, in their perspective, understand the struggles that they have experienced, that they continue to experience. Uh, now, I, am a, uh, I, I support the police. I don't support defunding the police. I think uh, overall, police are good people. They're trying their hardest to serve us and help us, uh, but there are examples of police that are abusive. And in those, in those instances, we need to be uh, uh, fully uh, going after them. We need to be prosecuting them. But we, the rest of us, need to be coming together. We need to be having these important discussions. We need to be coming up with solutions to address these, uh, uh, these inequities and come together as a, as a population. Thank you very much. CMAC, how would you proactively address civil unrest in the era of Black Lives Matter and defunding the police? So as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, I started my career as a correctional uh, and probation officer. So I have a deep understanding and appreciation for law enforcement. And I know the sacrifices they make day in, day out. They put their lives in danger day in, day out. At the same time, I understand the, uh, the many challenges that they face and I would very much like to make sure that they get all the treatment that they require as a, um, as a result of the uh, experiences they have, including PTSD. So further training in mental health, that is my field. I believe they absolutely could benefit from that much more than we have. The Utah legislature has done a good job in the past um, uh, by br bringing um, in training uh, for uh, law enforcement, but we need to do much more than that. We're seeing that. At the same time, on the other hand, I understand the anguish that people feel when repeatedly the African-American and people of color are, are being um, shot and killed uh, by law enforcement. I understand that. And I have worked with the local um, Black Lives Matter folks to make sure that we have a solution we actually bring people together and sit down, but it doesn't happen in vacuum. Thank you very much. All right, CMAC, we'll give you the next question first. Please explain your views on the role of money in politics and the public's right to know. I'm sorry, you say that again? Yes, please explain your views on the role of money in politics and the public's right to know. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> well, one of the things that I would, if I, if I had my um, say in this, I would absolutely take money out of politics. I mean, it's very easier said than done. I understand that. But if we could in this country take all the money out of it, give all candidates equal amount of exposure in media to deliver the message and cut out the influence of lobbyists and special interests, that would be a great place to start. As long as we have companies um, don't, um, contributing unlimited amount of money to campaigns, that is just recipe for corruption. So if I had my way, I would say, I would like to take money out of politics and have equal amount of exposure, whether it's through media or, and any other uh, forum to make sure that everybody is on the equal playing field. All right, thank you very much, Robert. Yeah, I agree. I think we, we, we absolutely need to have, uh, well, and, and one, in addition to that, what, what I'd add is one of the really important thing is disclosure. 
We need to know exactly where the money is coming from, who is giving it, uh, and so we can understand, you know, I don't think money directly impacts uh, uh, politicians' decisions, but we, it's a piece of information that we need to know. One of the things I've been very concerned about is dark money in campaigns. Uh, it, it, it's something that I think has become more per pervasive in the last few years, and it's something that we need to be uh, seriously going after. So one of the things that I'm really proud of is I sponsored a bill a few years ago in the, uh, in the legislature to address this issue in Utah. What we had was people were uh, taking cash donations, bundling those cash donations, and then essentially just uh, uh, claiming them as one large donation. So if they were uh, small money all bundled together, they didn't have to declare where it came from. So I sponsored a bill and it passed a bipartisan bill that changed that got rid of that, got rid of that ability to bundle, that ability to, to hide that dark money, and now we have more disclosure in the state. All right, thank you. Okay, we're moving on to some of our submissions from the audience at this time. A little bit of messy moderating here, but I have a follow-up question for what was actually our second question. So if you can think back to your answers about women's equality, we have an audience member who is requesting that each of you can state whether or not you support the Equal Rights Amendment. CMAC, would you like to go first? Yes, I would be, I would be proud to say yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Robert? Yeah, in fact, I've been uh, meeting with the, the I, I met several times with the people that have been uh, promoting that in the state of Utah. Um, I, I think it's certainly something that, that uh, uh, that I could support, that I could get behind. I think, I mean, what's really interesting is the Utah Constitution already uh, has the kind of protections that they're seek seeking at the national level. So to me, it's an easy one. I mean, why, why would we not have a guarantee of equal rights for everyone? Great, thank you very much. This question is submitted by Nancy Moose from the audience. And we'll go to Robert first. Uh, Robert, do you favor using any rainy day funds to support those struggling in this economy due to COVID-19? What is your plan for helping those left behind with this economy? Yeah, so that, I'll, I'll tell you, this is, uh, th this is something I've really, uh, not knowing it, but it's something I've been preparing for my uh, entire career. Um, you know, kind of looking, watching the economy, paying attention to what was going on. Um, no one saw this coming. It was, it, this is the example of the ultimate black swan. Uh, it, it hit us without warning and it hit us dramatically. And we need to be willing to use every tool in our tool belt uh, to, to, to fight this, to get our, to, to address the virus, but also to address the uh, economic aftermath. Uh, so far, the state of Utah has been very successful. Uh, we've been able to uh, address it without, uh, uh, now we have tapped into our ready day funds a little bit, but we haven't had to dramatically tap into those, but that's why we have rainy day funds. It, I'll, I'll tell you folks, it's raining. Um, and if we need to tap into that, we will fully tap into all of those. Thank you very much, Seema. Well, if this is not raining, uh, just like Robert said, if this is not raining, I mean, this is a flood. And we have thousands of our neighbors, of our friends, that are uh, in the process of being evicted from their apartments, their homes, because they just cannot afford it, um, because they don't have a job. We have thousands of people in the restaurant industries that have not opened, they cannot open, they cannot work. And so this is the classic definition of reigning. This is when we need to step up and help our friends and family and neighbors to make sure that they have a path to recovery. Um, the, uh, we cannot call, call ourselves the best well-run and best um, economic state in the country when we have a thousand uh, people in uh, the process of being evicted. So we need to step up and we need to make sure that we take care of them with the funds that we all have invested. Thank you. All right, we'll take another question from the audience. Um, this one will go to CMAC first. Um, if you are elected, what issue would be your first priority when you get into the legislature? Well, I have three that I want to attack first day. Um, as all politicians say, on day one, I want to do everything, right? Um, 
one of the things that is obviously a, a passion of mine is to make sure that we address the, the question of addictions and mental health in this country. So in the past six months, we've had a rate of addictions, depression, and suicide skyrocket in our, in our uh, country and even in, in our state. So that is something that we're not really talking about. We're talking about the, uh, the effects of COVID-19, but the, uh, the other victims of it are in the background. That is something that I want to step up and say, we need to address that. We need to create opportunities and pathway to these people getting treatment. Lot right now, a lot of people cannot afford it and do not have any vehicle to, to access those mental health and addictions treatment. So I would like to be a champion for those inside the uh, Utah State Legislature. Thank you. And Robert, for you, what um, issue or bill are you looking forward to working on the most if you're reelected for 2021? Yeah, thanks. And, and, and I think uh, uh, what CMAC said is, is absolutely true. Uh, mental health needs to be one of our, needs to continue to be one of our priorities. And I just want to, you know, g give a shout out to Representative Steve Ellison, who has been working on this issue his entire time in the legislature. And the legislature has made this one of our main focuses. Just a few of the things that we've done in the last few years. We've cre uh, uh, increased funding for crisis receiving centers. We created the Safe UT app, which is a national leader in uh, providing resources. Uh, and and we, uh, we, we've continued to make this one of the areas that we need to be addressing. We're, our suicide rates are way too high, uh, but I think we're moving in the right direction. One of the good things uh, is in the last five years, female suicide has dropped by about 20%, but we've still got to be doing a lot more. Now, another one of the areas that I'm really focused on, kind of going back to the coronavirus, um, this is something that I that we cannot take our foot off the uh, off the uh, off the gas. Uh, we have to continue to be providing the resources to those people that are really struggling in those small businesses. That's why this summer I sponsored the bill to create the In Utah program, working with uh, economic development and the arts and workforce services to help these people that are really struggling in a strategic way, but also helping our entire state. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our closing arguments. And I would like to thank you both for being very agreeable and reasonable during this time. I think we're setting a good example for those who are debating at a different level. Um, I thank do you. think that as we close, I would like to ask each of you to tell us one of the ways that you differ from the other one. Um, Robert, would you like to go first? I don't know that we're, I, I you know, I, I, what I'd like, I don't know. I think we're all kind of the same. We're part of the, the same community. We're, we are uh, all trying to work together. We're all trying to find solutions. Um, the, now, what I can say is what I think that uh, the benefit that I think I bring to, to this job and to my service is I have the experience, the understanding and the passion to do this job. I, it, I've, I've spent my career uh, on trying to improve our state, trying to find what the thing I love about public policy is uh, we're trying to come together to address really difficult issues. None of these are easy. None of, there's no silver bullets uh, in any of these, but uh, I love bringing people together. I love uh, working with my constituents and working with other people throughout the state to say, how can we uh, build these bridges? How can we come together and find uh, these difficult solutions? And uh, if I'm reelected, I will continue to uh, work with everyone and uh, try to find solutions to these issues. Thank you. CMAC, would you like to go on with your closing arguments? All right. I also want to second uh, what Representative Spanlov said, that we, we all live in this community. We're part of this community. And I, as a matter of fact, I think if I throw a rock, not that I would, but if I throw a rock, I'd probably hit Robert's house uh, from here. <laughs> Please don't. Um, so, no, I won't. <laughs> so, and I have tremendous respect for uh, Robert and his work, and I um, and thank you for, for your service. That said, I decided to run for this office because District 49 um, lacks accountable representation. Well, the citizens of Utah, and especially our District 49, passed Propositions 2, 3, and 4, the legislature. Uh, defied the will of people by gutting it and repealing it. 
the revised version of the Medicaid expansion was a significantly more expensive version while covering significantly fewer people, 38%. The legislature also put forward the, the disastrous, unpopular tax reform bill, which our district uh, constituency uh, vehemently opposed. I will champion better access to mental health and addictions treatment for our neighbors, and I will be the voice of our district, as well as the people of Utah. My platform pillars include accountable representation, healthcare accessibility and affordability, prioritizing education, and improving healthcare. And again, I want to thank everyone for uh, giving me this opportunity and Representative Spenlove. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much to you both, to the candidates. Thank you to everyone who attended the League of Women Voters of Utah and um, the Utah um, Better Utah Institute. It's been a really lovely evening and I appreciate your cooperation and your time. Thank you. Thank you.